I'd like to welcome you to the program between um, uh, Parish Life and the Business and Professional Women's Club as we welcome our former minister, the Reverend Dr. James Polk. African-American minister hired for staff of Riverside Church. As a matter of fact, when my mom and I joined in 1969, Dr. Polk was on staff. I'd like to begin the meeting by reading today's verse from the Daily Word. I grow in God's grace. When a burden begins to feel lighter, when a happy moment becomes truly joyous, when the wave through a frustrating challenge suddenly becomes clear, I know that I am experiencing grace. Unity minister and author Eric Butterworth explains grace this way, God's desire to express completely through you and as you is so great that you never completely reap the harvest of error and you always reap more good than you sow. This is grace. Grace is God's gift, constantly available to everyone willing to receive it. I look to God alone as the source of my good. I discover the guiding, healing, prospering presence of God everywhere I go, in everything I do, and in everyone I meet. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, John chapter 1, verse 16. Thank you, Linda. For those who don't know me, I'm the Reverend Deborah Northern, Minister of Parish Care. I've had the great fortune of of sharing in conversation with Reverend Polk many a times, and each time I had such regret that um, I didn't capture the conversations um, either on film or tape. So um, I ask that he join us here for Black History Month uh, and just share a little about his experience here on staff as the first um, minister of color getting somewhere in 1960, I believe, but he'll share a little more about that. Uh, in light of what we've already talked about this morning, it's critical that we have an understanding of our own history, if we are ever to understand who we are and where we're going and what God is calling us to. I think it's critical that we capture um, some of that history. And so we've been fortunate, blessed to have Reverend Pope travel from Philadelphia to join us in conversation and to share the rich background that he has had uh, here serving on the other side uh, staff. So without further ado, um, Reverend Dr. Robert Polk, who joined Riverside staff in 1960 the first time. So um, I'd love to know because I don't recall you actually sharing with me how that happened. Did you apply for a job? Did someone recruit you? Um, and what was the appeal? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Deborah. Uh, she called, I called her Deborah, she called me Bob. You know, we're informal in that way. Let me say, first of all, how delighted I am to be home, in my church home. I'm probably one of the oldest members in the church in terms of membership. There are a few older than when I joined the church in 1960. And I've been a member ever since, even though I've lived in different parts of the country uh, during this period of time. But going back to Deborah's question, uh, first of all, I want to say a couple of other things. Uh, this morning was a beautiful morning in the nave. I thought Deborah preached an outstanding sermon. I want to say thank you, Deborah. I pay you for that. And the thank thing that was so impressive was the fact that uh, when I walked in, the sermon, the service began. 
I felt it was like home again. I felt a sense of there being a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And uh, the whole service tied into that sweet spirit. Same thing with the spiritual or ill. And uh, the message was well crafted. It was good. But more importantly, at my age, I was born two years before Riverside Church was built. Uh, and at my age, I hear a lot of sermons. But the one thing that caught me was the fact that it was, I was inspired by it. It was a spiritual sermon. Not just well-crafted, good information, good exegesis, good biblical context and all, but something that really made me feel that I'm in church and I can resonate with all the things that took place this morning, and especially the sermon. When I finished seminary in 1955, I couldn't find a church to go to. I'm a congregationalist, that's my denominational background, and uh, there were few congregational churches of color in America, and all of them were occupied by clergy. Uh, some were large, most were small, some in the south were quite small. So I had to decide what I wanted to do. My seminary couldn't place me because all of the New England, I went to Hartford Seminary in Connecticut, all of my seminary, all the churches in Connecticut were big, white, fancy, you know, well-endowed churches. So I had spent one summer as a summer student minister in a place called Garrison, North Dakota. And the, uh, the conference minister, which would be a bishop in some of the denominations, said when I was looking for a church, if I found you a church in North Dakota, would you come? And, oh gosh. <laughs> I guess I would, you know, I've got to find a church. Folks helped to pay me for this education, college, and seminary. And so I accepted the call to go to a little town called Berthold, North Dakota. And that was the most primitive place in 1955 you could expect. No running water, no paved streets, no indoor bathroom, snakes were in the outhouse, you know, 37 below zero. What can you expect? So I stayed there two years and had a magnificent time. Before leaving that parish, they couldn't afford to keep me any longer. I was making $2,700 a year. The YMCA in Minot, that's the biggest city near it to Berthold, moving up north toward the border, if you don't know your history, I mean geography, Minot invited me to come and be its YMCA youth director because they were built in a big jet base in Minot. These were all Scandinavian and German towns. And so I went to the wines, they, wanted, they knew that there would be, there would be uh, black troops coming into the air base. They thought, oh, we got Polk here, he can help us to uh, provide some kind of bridge between our, name, our people that are coming in and the residents here. And so I went to the wines and worked for three years as youth director. Had 450 kids, junior high, senior high, having a great time, and lo and behold, I had a letter in 1960 from Riverside Church say, saying that they were looking for a new youth minister. The one they had had just resigned and was going elsewhere, and would I be interested? There's a long story to that, but I won't get into that. And you know, I thought, you know, not a seminary classmate of mine would ever have thought of being invited to come to Riverside Church, nor from Yale, nor from Harvard, from Harvard nor from Chicago Seminary. Why me, Lord, you know? And I said, well, I'll talk. I talked over with some of my friends, and they said, I apply for it. I applied for it, and uh, they invited me up for an interview. I came up, stayed at the old New Yorker Hotel. Uh, you know, didn't even have a razor blade. I was just gonna be here for one day overnight, I'm back in Chicago, going back to North Dakota. And uh, I met all the clergy in the collegium in those days, except the senior pastor. Uh, Robert McCracken, Dr. McCracken, asked me if I would stay over one day to meet him, but they were all favorably impressed. I was interviewed by the youth committee of the church, who were under the auspices of the Christian Education Department. And uh, they, they liked it. They interviewed five people the same day in small groups around the city. And the group that met me, they thought I would be the right person for the job. So they offered me the job, Deborah, took the job, and the rest is history. Yeah. 
<laughs> Not so. So can you share a little bit about your role as a youth minister? I know you shared um, sort of outreach that was done back then. And I'd be curious to know what kind of support staff you, you had to. Just Let me say this. first what Riverside was like in 1960. It's not anything like what I see looking in front of me today. These were captains of industry and lady bountifuls. People came in limousines. They were heads of industry in the city of New York, bank presidents, president of TWA, um, heads of the YMCA and the YWCA. They were the creme de la creme. Uh, but with the mission to do something more with Riverside. And they had just branched on the idea of, it was a Baptist church, of becoming Baptist and congregational, becoming far more inclusive than the Baptist were, or the Baptist. And so they um, wanted to become interracial, international, and interdenominational. And uh, the name, you couldn't get a seat in the nave on Sunday morning without waiting in line. There'd be 3,000 people waiting to come into church. Dr. McCracken followed Dr. Fosdick, and Dr. Fosdick had his own, you know, name. And um, the, they had just built bread houses. They had just, the, the uh, Morningside Gardens was opened by that time in 1960, and they were about to build uh, Manhattan community houses and the youth department of this church, the kids in the Sunday school where I would be working, had put postal cards under the, the doors in grand houses inviting the teenagers to come to their youth program. And lo and behold, they were shocked because a couple hundred of these kids came here, black and Hispanic, they didn't know what to do with them. I mean, that's why I got the job, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I, would have been, I would have gotten that job if, if, if had everything remained the way it was. And so um, we had to learn how to develop a program in our educational department, particularly teenagers, junior and senior high, that would work in the, the confines of that kind of environment, the milieu, as we would say. And, um, you know, it was difficult, but we took lay people from the church and matched them with students from the seminary, team teaching, Sunday mornings, three hours, it was like Rice Christians. If you didn't come to church on Sunday morning, Sunday school, you couldn't come to recreation on Friday night. And so uh, we had to sit down there and check them in. They weren't able to, no, not the Pope, my mother was sick. Oh no, she was sick last week. Well, she's still sick, couldn't get here. But they came, they came in droves, and we were able to blend a fine youth program and a fine Christian education program also. So the, the atmosphere here, Deborah, was certainly different from what we find today. And it's an opportunity to look back, as you did this morning, to find out what nurtured us, what brought us to where we are today. A young man was down at the table this afternoon after coffee, during the coffee hour, who talked about Riverside's always been, you know, churning and uh, uh, involved in crises and uh, theological, philosophical, social issues that uh, would make most churches cringe. But uh, we have always been able to, to ride out these kind of issues. So any sense of um, how that shift took place? Um, was it during your six years, your initial time here, or when you returned, was there a noticeable difference? It was beginning to yeah, you know, they would invite Dr. King to preach. And you've never seen so many black people in the congregation in your life. You know? and who were they? Chauffeurs and maids and people that came in with the madam and the mister, you know, to, to, to the service. Uh, this is during the time when there was a white flight in the big cities. Mm. And whites were leaving. Morningside Heights, however, was pretty stable, even though Columbia University had seriously considered leaving the heights and going where the grass was greener. And uh, so it finally made a decision with this Board of Trustees to stay and to hold on to these apartments on uh, 
Claremont Avenue, Riverside Drive, West End, you know, uh, around in the area. So the uh, place was um, a stacked, a static here, but it was fluid in the city. So what happened, we began to see the change in membership over a period of time, particularly after Dr. King would come to preach and Riverside was preaching the fact that it was interracial, interdenominational, international. And many black people from Harlem and from some of our suburbs felt that, you know, if I'm really going to be serious about, you know, my, my God and my faith and my conscience, then maybe I need to join a church if I'm going to be a Christian that reflect that thinking and not just be in an all-black church or an all-white church. And Riverside was the place for them. And so they began to come up from Church of the Master, Jim Robinson, right down the hill here, the other side of Morning Side Park. They come from um, St. Uh, Mark's, United Methodist Church, they come up from Abyssinia, people were coming from as far as Philadelphia, a lot of New Jersey people were coming because they liked the idea as to what was happening during this period of time. The greatest, someone said on the TV the other day, Probably the greatest part of our history, the ones that, you know, people that are 90 and below, 1960s, to the, to, you know, until the present administration got together, we were working together, you know, developing together, you know. Bs and Ps were, you know, really popular when I was here. They all wanted to date me, but I didn't let it happen. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the trend began to change but you could see the white people leaving and the blacks coming in and the Hispanics coming in. We had a Hispanic ministry, Pablo Cotta is the ministry, in a little church called the uh, you know, Hispanic Congregation. They met in Christ Chapel every Sunday, except the first Sunday of every month. They would meet with the name, in the name, and he would be in the service. Now, they loved Dr. McCracken's brogue. He was a, he was a, he was a uh, Scotsman. But they couldn't understand the Hispanic brogue from Dr. Cotto. You know, you can find these little indices that people would talk about. I didn't understand it. They loved Dr. McGregor's brogue because he was white, genteel, scholar, great preacher, crafted sermons. You know, but you know, they could see the new wave coming in. They made a difference. Stop. Stop. No. Um, so can you share a little bit um, about what your experience was personally? How did you navigate the spaces? And, and not just this, because it sounds like um, when you were in North Dakota, um, you were the first or the only there as well. I'm just curious, how did you manage? What was, what was the climate like? Um, I grew up in a community that was, uh, you know, we, it was all white at one point. Black began to move in in Chicago, in the South Side, a place called Woodlawn. And uh, we had all white teachers for a long time before they didn't hire any black teachers in, America, in the Chicago school system. And uh, belonged to the Congregational Church. It's a white denomination. And between my mother and uh, my church, we talked about exposure. That's the one word that has stuck with me the rest of my life. If you're exposed to people, you get to know them won't have these attitudes and feelings. You might have a lot of disagreements and fall apart and you know, people cry, they don't understand you, but you have to have that exposure. I was the 38th black person in the state of North Dakota, the 1950 census. 37 before I got here, 38 or 39, whatever it was. And I never saw a black person thought it in the mirror. When I came here, I felt that you know, I, I grew up with white people because I was this, this white denomination, just for a little essay about it. And, uh, you know, we struggled to get to know each other, uh, to work in the area of social action, the area of racial justice, the area of getting to know each other. And uh, the old song from you know, King and I, Getting to Know You, and 15, 25 teenagers. So when I came here, I felt, you know, as many black people feel today, you know, I know more about white people than they will ever know about black people. It's just the way life is. If you 
because we've been your maids, your butlers, your servants, your washers and ironers. When uh, white people wanted to tell their stories and could deal with life, they tell it to the black people. And that's been true, whether it's a bartender or a maid or whatever. So when I came here, I had no fear about getting to know white people. My fear was working in a church that was so rich and so well endowed and so full of, you know, corporate people. And uh, interestingly enough, Deborah, the, um, uh, some of the staunchest white people didn't want to get away from the old, from not being diverse were some of the sort of lower middle class white people at Riverside Church who were just so happy to be here. Um, they couldn't stand the thoughts of being diverse and bringing big black people into their group. One group was called the Epicureans. They met for years. We met each other whatnot, and they said, you got to be integrated, and we won't do that. Uh, people called me the N-word. Uh, someone just spoke, Mrs. Campbell just spoke to me about being on duty uh, when her mother was ill at the hospital. And I went to see her mother. She was in bad shape, and I met Mrs. Campbell. It was Mrs. Campbell at the time. We took turns being on duty. I've had 300 weddings, probably. Somebody wrote me today about me the other day about having married a friend, she's here I hope. And uh, you know, they didn't know what they were getting because I was a black staff member. And sometimes they would try to circumvent that and they would want not that black guy over there, but the, one of the white ministers. We were living in tough times. It's as much glory as you could discover that came out of that period of time. One lady said, you know, I don't want that in guy working for me over here talking to me. I don't care who he is. Um, Right, when talking to somebody constantly, who are you? Oh, I'm Reverend Paul. Are you that nigga minister? I, don't talk to me. I'm not in bad shape, you know. A lot of barriers that were put up. I mean, not the top people that I just mentioned, the you know, barons of industry. These were the middle level people. And they still, these are the people who beat Trumpites now. They don't probably say that. They've been around for a long time. And uh, so you had to, you know, navigate those shores or whatever you call it to, to, to make yourself feel comfortable. The saving factor, my teenagers and their parents and my youth committee, law professors, deacons, people that knew that I was doing a good job, uh, and, you know, the others had a soft pedal their feelings for me and being the only black person. Now, one th two things. The first or the second time that Dr. King preached, Dr. McCracken was in charge of worship services. That was his thing. He, he preached and he organized the services. Well, here were all these people here, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't preaching the Black Church in Harlem. They didn't want him to preach there. He preached at Riverside. I'm going to say something about that before I leave, too. And uh, there, the group of ladies, they were YWCA women. They were tough as nails. Little, little old white ladies, you know. I, I live with a, 200 of them in Philadelphia, so I can say that in love. And they went up to him after the service and said, Dr. McGregor, you didn't even have Bob Polk in the service? You got one black person on your staff and Dr. King spoke? Well, he didn't even think about it. That never happened again. Whenever Dr. King came again, I was in the service. I had another thought, uh, and I can't think of it. Go ahead. <laughs> Pardon? Well, so I was going to say, um, I needed you to say a little more about Dr. King's visit, but if you want to hold off on that. Um, I believe you were instrumental in starting the Black Christian Caucus. Was that during the first, your first step here? No, 70, uh, 60, 68, 69. Yeah. Okay. By the time I, 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 went, I left in 1966, after six years of being here, I had a call from Brethren of Village University offered me the job as the dean of chapel. And one of the members of the church, uh, white members here, was a trustee there, and he recommended me. This guy couldn't keep chaplains, apparently. And to make a long story short, I went. And it only lasted two years. And I had a great time with uh, a thousand students that loved me to death, and I loved them. They didn't like the president, and neither did I. <laughs> he didn't like me. So I only lasted two years. When I came back to New York, 
to get a job, I had maybe three offers, and um, I was told that the police department used the assembly hall area for staging the place when they were going to uh, uh, invade Columbia University for the students who were protesting Vietnam. And you have to know, you know, a lot of social norms were really being challenged in those days. Not just Riverside and white flight. There was a war in Vietnam. There was, you know, the Freedom Riders and all those things were happening at the same time. And so, um, when I look at that conflagration, conflagration of people uh, and, and things that were happening, I had to realize this was a very, very dangerous place to be. So, any grounds that I had made as Minister to Youth with our young people, both our Columbia and Union Seminary and Juilliard uh, School of Music and Teachers College, kids that belonged to those faculty members that were still in the city, any grounds I'd made with some of the black and white kids from Morningside Gardens, that was going to be lost. That was all lost because they had a white now youth minister and the white policemen were in here, black and white I guess, to break not kids in the students in Columbia. So Riverside had lost a lot of ground. And so they asked me if I would come back and be their minister of urban affairs. And I would be the community worker. And so I went out, I did that job. And I uh, worked with the uh, Benevolence Committee who had a large grant of $75,000 a year to do things in the community. And uh, we took up offering, one major offering a year. So I had about $100,000 every year to pass out into the community to help to bridge that gap. Um, and so that's how we were able to try to bring Riverside back from the brink, as it were, and make it, you know, genuine again. So you served under two different administrations. One was McCracken and the, the other um, Campbell. 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 Uh, the follower, uh, Dr. Ernest Campbell followed Dr. McCracken. And uh, that's when things began to break down. Now let me say if I had started this off the way I wanted to, the way I thought about it all night, I would have started it a lot differently because it would, it would have been my speech and not Deborah's telling me asking questions. Um, Riverside is like a kaleidoscope. Kaleidoscope, what do you call those things? You know, through. Yeah. Come on. Okay. Yeah. If you talk, I mean, all of my all of my fellow clergy colleagues have died, except maybe two. <clears throat> Jim Foreman, Jim Forbes. No, Jim. Uh, Holmes. Foreman. No, no, no. Jim Holmes. Jim Holmes, thank you. Jim Holmes and uh, Jim Farmer. Yeah, I think they're still living. The others have all died. Kraken, Laubach. Gilkey and Lyons, and all those names to remember. And um, a lot of staff have changed. If you ask anybody that's worked here three to five years plus, it would give you a totally different story to what I'm giving you today. So don't try to, don't think that I'm telling you the way Riverside was in everybody's eye. It's different. So when Jim Farmer came and Dr. And Dr. Campbell came, things began to change. The white light had taken place in the process of tapering off. And I noticed something happening. It just dawned on me as I was trying to think about today that Jim Farmer was head of parish life and, and, and new members. And he started, he started coding, coding people who joined the church if they weren't white, would say Hispanic or black. And what a terrible thing that was, you know. Didn't want to have an overflow of people of color in this white Mr. Rockefeller's you know, church. And number one, doc, number two, <clears throat> Dr. Campbell was from 116th and Broadway, uh, the Presbyterian Church there. Very conservative. They hated Riverside Church. <laughs> they hated Harry Emerson Foster. And uh, he'd gone to uh, Bob Jones and then to uh, I forget what the seminary was. But he had, you know, he had a come to Jesus moment, and so he became, you know, quasi-liberal, and he was. But 
Dr. Campbell was a preaching minister again. He was not a pastoral minister or a person that reached out. His thing was the, the pulpit. And that's why we had that thing when James Farmer came, James Forbes came. Foreman, Foreman. Foreman, Foreman. 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 I don't think any of the sort of other kind of clergy would have walked out because you know, there was something to be said and to be listened to here. But they set up a whole code. If this happens again, so and so, you go down and pull the main switch, technically, to, to, to turn all the lights out, the organ's going to go full blast, and nobody can hear anybody else. Well, it never happened again. But uh, the mindset was not all these black people coming to tell us what to do, reparations integration, etc. And Dr. Campbell was a very, you know, a very honest man, very liberal man in terms of his social policies. Uh, but things began to happen that he was an egalitarian. Um, pardon me? Mm -hmm. say? No. Okay. Um, he made sure that the Board of Trustees, you know, we, had, we had a bicameral board then, we had deacons and trustees. Trustees were responsible for the, you know, $800 million endowment, or whatever it was, and the deacons were responsible for the life of the church. And so the trustees all met down with Mr. Rockefeller, Rockefeller Plaza, 49th floor. And so with Campbell, this thing happened on, with uh, Jim Foreman, reparations. Campbell was convinced that the trustees ought to meet back here. And so he was, you know, going to make everybody kind of on a, on a level. Um, again, some of the top echelons, top people left the church because they didn't want to be, they thought that's where they should be, where the, where the power was. Um, so under Campbell, he was a blue collar guy, he came from a blue collar family, uh, you know, he didn't like all this fancy stuff, and even did Bill Coffin, but Bill, Bill Coffin was from a life, you know, from a higher class family. I mean, these things are just the way we look at life in America. It's like Donald Trump versus Bloomberg, you know. He's rich because his father gave him money, not because he was born to the manor house, you know, so forth and so on. That's the way it was there. People had to know who you were and what your connections were. And uh, so more and more blacks came in. Now, a lot of the black people came to the to Riverside Church, in, in, I won't say in droves, but in large numbers. And they felt lost. This is a cathedral church. In a cathedral church and a parish church. Some of us got together at my home with my wife and I and said, you know, can we do something to help people who are of color become familiar and friendly and feel like they're part of this place, number one. Number two, over a period of time, when we got our mission together, we wanted to make sure we helped black people uh, integrate into the boards and committees, and deacons and trustees of the church. And that was a little more difficult. And along parallel to the Black Christian Caucus in a group called RIPS, they were basically all white. They tried to do the same thing. Younger people, who they thought the power struggle, the power structure was hampering the church's progress. So that's when things began to break over. And the Black Christian Caucus was a fellowship group. There's also was a transitional group helping blacks to become deacons. And the guy that became a trustee, we never liked them, so they didn't not a part of that group, his wife was. And uh, so it became more uh, more fluid, if we put it that way. And uh, with all the Christian trimmings that we think we have at Riverside Church, the P's and P's were always support group. And there were many of them. They were the first group to help to break the ceiling, glass ceiling in their jobs. They were black, they were white, they were lovely, they were beautiful, they were cranky, they were all the things that you know, people could be. Big group of them. They took retreats together, upstate, and traveled together, they made lasting friends together, but they were one of the stable forces of the church. Uh, the men's class was basically 90% white. That was Mr. Rockefeller's Bible class, and he used to have a Jimmy Carter has a Bible class. He died, and he kept, kept it as a men's class. Their last biggest thing was to honor Thurgood Marshall in the Morningside Garden. A lot of very popular people, with high profile blacks that came to Riverside at that point. Constance Baker Motley, uh, E. Frederick Murrow, who used to work at the 
Captain uh, Nixon, uh, Thurgood Marshall, people that lived over at the yard, they came down from Sugar Hill, uh, Post, uh, Blackness, uh, Oliver and Sonstock. So it was really a mixture of people that came up from Church of the Master. When Jim Robinson left, a large number came into the church. So a, a large group of black professional middle class people came, doctors, lawyers, any corporate people yet at that point, but moving in that direction. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your highlights? My highlights? Mm -hmm. Some of the more memorable um, times that you had. I know you shared with me the experience with um, Alvin Ailey. Um, you know, so yeah. You know, but I, I'm when I was youth, when I was a, my second go round here, when I was Minister of Urban Affairs, it put me in touch with a lot of organizations, and uh, particularly in Harlem, black organizations who were struggling. And then I had the first trade that you know, hundred thousand dollars. That was the foundation director giving stuff out with the help of the church, the deacons, had a committee that you know, I was accountable for. Nothing ever got bad, but bad. Man. And um, so uh, joining the Alvin Ailey board was one of the high points of my life because I was trying to put on a, an interfaith, intercultural, multicultural arts festival, like the one downstairs that was very tiny, very multicultural. And two ladies in the congregation, the congregation was full of great people. I mean, all kinds of folk. We had seven psychiatrists in this congregation. You all went down there to go downtown ever see a psychiatrist. We had them right here, right here. And two ladies said, oh, we know how to do that. Can we help you? And they did. And one of the ladies was the wife of the executive director of the Albany Company. And he was just beginning to think of, uh, of, uh, of chartering a board of directors out of sort of a mom and pop shop. He didn't have any trustees or how to raise money, etc. So they asked me if I would join this new board. And I did. And I said yes. And I was there 20 years. We did some fabulous things. Many of you who were around will know that we had dancers in the nave from Ailey Company. Biggest thing you have a Judith Jamison dance cry in the uh, South Hall. Uh, people said, You can't do that. I said, yeah, we can. How are you going to do it? Well, crying takes up a lot of space, almost the half the side of this room. So we said, Okay. I said, Okay. We're going to sing the Battle of the Republic. We're going to march pew by pew. There were about 800 people there from the nave to the South Hall. Cry run 17 minutes. You get to the South Hall, she'll be ready, the curtains will be there, we'll open the curtains, the music will come up and she'll dance cry. A fabulous job. But Alvin Ailey's group has danced here at least two or three times. Um, so I had, you know, I'm trying to Lorraine, what's her name? That, the mother of she. No, no, not Hansberry, Lorraine. Oh, um. They had home from Mother Hale. Mother Hale, mother thank you. Yeah. We used to fund them every year, Mother Hale, uh, a number of other groups we funded because the outreach program, which was the mission program of the church, the Benevolent Society, I had them all here once to have a little uh, compartment say what they did down in the South Hall. But Riverside has had a strong outreach ministry. There used to be a strong connection between Church of the Master and Riverside Church and Abyssinia and Riverside Church. I passed a little doorway on the first balcony today. I said, I can swear. I said, damn, that's the place where I put handmade puppets 60 something years ago. I wonder if they're still in there. I don't think anybody ever goes to that little room. The lady that lives here, Mrs. She, was a, she, she did all the work in Central Park in terms of what would be flora and fauna in Central Park. Every weed, every flower, every blade of grass, she organized, did a big party for her. And people asked me, but she also made puppets. And she gave me the puppets for the kids, but the kids didn't want to be in the puppets. So I put them in that little door, in that little office back there, that room work, whatever, I have to check it out sometime. And they might still be there. I'm not clear what you're talking about, but you can That's share right. that. So, um, you know, those were some of the highlights and um, bringing Sorry, that Martin Luther King during his service. When he died, I was at Dillard, 4th of April, whatever it was, 68. And
And so when I came back here, we decided we'd have the King Memorial. But we didn't want to do it on his birth, on the, you know, we did it on the, on the April, the time of his death, because we felt that everybody would be doing something on his birthday. And so we started the King Services in Alvin Haley, through for Dad's Wars, Morehouse College Glee Club, would sing for us oftentimes. The Newark Boys Choir would sing, great speakers. Uh, those were very uh, genuine times and very warm times in terms of feeling that we were part of Riverside. And it all worked out very well. We had, there was no anxiety or angst into the church most of it all one. Great times. Met my wife here, so that was a good time. That was a high time. So, you know, we did a lot of good things. So we've talked a lot about um, the rich history of Riverside. Do you have any thoughts about, um, or would you like to share what you imagine as a direction for Riverside? How's it looking from your perspective? Well, I'm so old that, you know, <laughs> I'm old to the dirt. And, uh, is Campbell here? Yeah, you know. Is she gone? She's 99. No, I'm still in there, Bob. Pardon? I'm still in there. Right. Hey there. So, you know, things have changed so dramatically. And uh, churches are having a very difficult time sustaining who they are. The gospel is still the same, as Deborah pointed out this morning. We have to look at that and find our strength and our bearing and our future from the gospel as we know it. And this so, as it was so articulately read this morning, both readers were magnificent. Um, and our faith has to be strong. I'm going to close with you know, in that first line of Bob makes him God of grace and God of glory. But um, I like to drop bombs periodically, but I'm not a bomb, bomb dropper. And I just thought Deborah was going to ask me for something like this. So this morning in my room, in New York City, I put down four things I wanted to say about Riverside's potential future, what they could be doing. It turned out to be five. Um, first of all, I think healing, healing, is the most important thing you can do. Reconciliation. If South Africa under Mr. Mandela could heal, Lord knows this church called Riverside could heal. Um, we all worry about the mega churches. Riverside was a mega church before the term was ever invented. Two, 90 years we've been up on this hill doing that. And we need to heal and be one. And the, the lectionary, either last week or two weeks ago, is one that you all learned in Sunday school, those of you who went to Sunday school. It's about salt and light. And uh, when I thought of salt, I thought it cleanses, it disinfects, and it heals. Light shines every place. There's no darkness where there's light. Light penetrates the darkness. Riverside should be that. It should be, and then yeast, that was the next one, which came along a little later. That's what Riverside should be doing. It should be, you know, touting what it does. Now, there's not a problem, it's just like a family. But you have to learn how to take what you have and the old adage, you take lemons and make lemonade. Um, there's so much I can say about Riverside. And I, I think about it and pray about it all the time. Riverside had a lot of darkness, a lot of bad things happened here. I mean, you would be shocked to hear something that I knew about. But the light and the salt and the yeast have just overshadowed that darkness. And from what I've learned from Deborah and some of the other clergy, what I've read in the papers, I 
many people understand new people, especially what Riverside is all about. What it can be, Reggie knows, and others of you know that I've known. Um, in terms of who we can be, and it's not about filling the pews, but it's about the mission, the gospel, what we're all about, which was articulated again so well this morning, and it permeated the service. And to walk into that service like this morning, you felt that. You thought, oh, I can be a part of this, you know. So healing is the first thing we have to think about. But there are four things that came to mind in anticipating Deborah's question. First of all, we need to spend time knowing who we are. This is just a tidbit of the history of a 90-year-old history this church. For anybody who's running for office next year ought to spend one year under the tutelage of a, a committee or staff to teach two, two hours every every other week, let's say, for a year. Theology, philosophy, ecclesiology, uh, how churches function that the church has lost. Uh, to understand the workings of, of the body of Christ that's been divided into denominations. Uh, every denomination comes about this differently. It takes a Catholic five years every Saturday to study to become a deacon. Well, Riverside says, now if you want to be a deacon, just sign up and we'll make you a deacon. Yeah. 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 We study that. You know, I looked at the Epiphany this morning, those there were about thinking about the Epiphany. Well, there should be a little further explanation. What the hell is Epiphany? And if I was coming from my little hall church in Chicago, we didn't, we didn't deal with the seasons. We just dealt with Christmas and Easter. You know what Epiphany? What is Epiphany? What is the church season all about? What is the church governance all about? Some churches have deacons, some have bishops and archbishops. The Baptists and the congregations don't have any of that kind of stuff. We need to understand that. A study program for anybody that wants to be a cluster of church officers ought to know. What does it mean to be uh, a business person, to be on the uh, budget and finance committee? Yeah. Uh, all those things. We don't know. We just join it because they ask us to do it. We need this. This is a billion dollar institution, my friends. I remember growing up having my teenagers. We couldn't come in this room without taking off our shoes. This was sacrosanct. Mm -hmm. Mrs. John D. Rockefeller appointed this room. And they had a door locked. You, we came in once a year for Christmas. It was a Christmas tree here. It was so fancy and so well you know, appointed. Nice stuff and all that stuff. Silver, glass, every tea party. Once a year. I mean, these and these came off and the teenagers died. So we need to understand what Mr. Rockefeller and Mr. Fostick were trying to do when they built this place. And try to get back to some of that. So that's one thing. The other bomb I would throw would be um, when you get yourself a new pastor, a new senior pastor, have a let the council have a nice fancy party where all the heads of the institutions on the hill, their presidents or top staff people come. Let's rebuild the relationships between Columbia, Manhattan School of Music, Teachers College, uh, you know, Bank Street, uh, Cathedral St. John and Yvonne. How many went to St. John and Yvonne, the, the Dean's funeral? St. John and Yvonne, they were good. See, you know, Dean Morton was a great guy, as was, Dean, as was Bishop Moore. And here we are, you know, two blocks apart practically, and we don't even know they exist except some of our people have now joined that church, joined the cathedral. We need to understand the difference between a cathedral and a parish church. Some are here for the cathedral, which is just to come and worship. Christmas, Easter, you know, Epiphany. And don't worry me with the problems, you know. I'll put my money in and go home. I don't want to be involved in the politics of the church. We 
going to be a part of a parish church, you're going to have to suffer and joyously understand how do you run a place like this? Who handles the investment portfolio? This church had the largest endowment of any church in America when it was built. And the old man built the South Wing because we had so much activity here. I 300 kids in Sunday school from nursery, kindergarten, up to the college program. We had to build the tower to take everything. We had, you know, arts and crafts, and library, and you know, choral teaching, all that stuff. So he built the South Wing because we needed to use it. We used to do everything was free here. Doctor, Mr. Rockefeller said nobody should be charged for anything to use the facility. That was back in the old days, obviously. Five or six public schools and private schools in the area had their graduate public schools had their graduation services in the nave because they didn't have enough space in their school. And our organist played, and I walked with the people, the kids, you know, and their parents. I've had several weddings. Kids that have come back to me and said, "I graduated the nave of Riverside Church." It's doing pride, and I want to come back and be married here. And so much to me. We have lost that. Everything is, you know, give me this, give me that. Accountability is gone. You know, sustainability is gone. All those things are gone. We've lost it. And we've got to get back to it. In the contemporary time, we can't go back to the way it was in 60 and 70 and 80, but in 2020 and 20 and, and, and moving forward. With the Chinese Christian Fellowship that was built into the church back, you know, 60 plus years ago. They met every Sunday afternoon. Most of those families have now passed on. We had the, we had the Ethiopian Fellowship in Christ Chapel. They met every, every Sunday. We had the Hispanic congregation that met. You know, we were really an interracial church. Um, Howard Thurman had the first interracial church in America called the Fellowship of All People in San Francisco. Great, great church. And we sort of patterned after that to our group, tied in with these two denominations, the Catholics, the Congregationalists that became the United Church of Christ. Connected with the World Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches. We had a, we had a Quaker group on the 10th floor. That was their room every Sunday. They didn't hear a peep out of them because they don't talk until the Spirit moves them. <laughs> but there they were. Quakers met every Sunday doing the program. Quaker meeting every Sunday in room. 10 or 1 or whatever it was. We did some joyous things back in those days. We were a mega church before the concept was created. We weren't just looking for ourselves. And we, we, we raised money. The old man said, I, these, are, these are very important things. Now he said, I will build the church. I will, I will furnish it. I will endow for all of the upkeep. But whatever programs you have in the church, you pay for it. And we did. We were the first time we went way up there. to the name of the, the, the address of the church. We raised $490,000. That was the highest back in the year of this. The congregation pulled off the money and then you know, we had stewardship every year to raise the money because the program was getting larger and larger and larger. So the church has a great history. Um, this is a small one, but it's going to be funny for you. I think in this high-tech world, what you did yesterday, for two years I was vice president of outreach for City College. How great it would be if high-tech would put the Carillon music here over City College. You know, there's some way up in that sky there that you could make that bell, those bells, ring there in Harlem as well as in at, at Columbia University. That's a small one, but it's kind of funny when you get it quirky, but nice. Um, and then, you know, my biggest bomb that I'm going to drop, and I've talked about this with Deborah and Ernest and Judith Wong, the best. I met Ernest, he was, stand up, Ernest. I met Ernest, he was seven years old. Six. His daughter was in my youth, his sister was in my youth program. Now he's 80. <laughs> he's not really 80. But uh, we've been friends all these years in those Sunday and private, Saturday, Friday afternoon programs. <laughs> but um, I saw this in the, in the train station yesterday. 
hundred people who changed the world. How many do we how many are represented in Riverside Church? Anybody can guess? Hundred people who changed the world. Who's on here that would be on Riverside Church someplace together? Jesus. Pardon? <laughs> Einstein. You know where he is? You know he, you know he was in front of the church? He's at the window. Tell us where he is. The stone carving over the front door. I X okay, track back with I X nine. Albert Schweitzer. Who went Christian? And there he is. Look at you, Washington. He's down in the nave. Right before he gets to the pulpit there. Humanitarians. Martin Luther King came all the time. And, you know, my thing is that I was, yesterday I went to eat in Harlem. I fasted, got in a circle. Good God. I can tend to Fifth Avenue, there's a Duke Ellington circle. <clears throat> my thing is, we ought to build a monument, a statue of Martin Luther King at Riverside Church. Something the church people can do. Thank you. <laughs> Members can do. We don't have to wait till the new minister comes. Put together a committee. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mammoth undertaking. But if you ever want to pull this church together again, I think that's one way it can be done. When I came out of the cab today, I came up to Oyster area and I looked out. And said, There's a spot where the, the four chaplains were buried there. The monument to the four chaplains just above me, outside of the a great place. Or you put it on the building, they'll put it in the South Hall, wherever you want to put it. But I think there's not a major statue of King in the city of Manhattan, in New York. And, you know, the grace, I think it's about four or five hundred thousand dollars, maybe a million dollars to do it. It can be done. And if you bring people together, if you pay a dollar, like Bernie Sanders' campaign, or you can get, you know, the former mayor, whatever his name is, running for president, I didn't give you a hundred million. <laughs> so you go from that, like the um, Vietnam War monument, everybody's name should be someplace. We can go to a kiosk and tap it in. Oh, there's Robert Polk, he gave $5, yeah, in 1925 and so forth and so on. But to bring the church together, have a grand unveiling of, of you know, what do you call it, the open something started, and a grand closing, and remember the buses come by, and the, 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 the boats on the river, or inside the church, that's just where it was remembered. So, Deborah, you know, you asked me what some of the highlights were and then what some of the things we should be doing. We need to reconcile ourselves, we need to find ways to come together as a body of Christ. We need to uh, have more services like we had this morning, where people felt that this was their come to Jesus time. Don't say it that way. And uh, people will start coming back. Yeah. And uh, that's not the goal, but certainly when you worship, when you, when you let Jesus be the person that you pattern yourself after, you might go to the country for the weekend, but ultimately you're going to come back to church and be a part of the body of Christ in this larger context. That's what I'm saying. Well, I thank you so much for sharing. I thank you for your continued support and I think these fireside chats are wonderful. Thank you. And, and I think Deborah can do more of these uh, once a month, however she, often she plans to do them. They're, you know, one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. How many of you saw Just Mercy, the movie? You know that he spoke here one time, Stevenson? He spoke at, he spoke at the uh, prison ministry task force when they had a, uh, a lectureship in my name. He was the first speaker, and uh, he was a magnificent person. And I do believe if we ever have a Democratic president again, his name will be on the list for the Supreme Court. Brian Stevenson. Don't forget it. Go see Just Mercy. Read the book and understand what's going on.
Go down to Alabama and see where people are lynched. 4,000 of us. Okay, we're talking about going back this morning. My mother ran into the end of a lynching in Georgia when she was a child, teenager. And it's all in one place now. They've, they've identified these places. Brian Stevenson. You know, we've had great people here. And we will continue to have them. We do. Sunday, you know, one Sunday a month, bring in a preacher from some place and get to know him and have a fireside chat and pick their brains. What I've said is nothing compared to how people are thinking today, theologically, philosophically, technically, futuristically, intelligent, what do you call it, ID, intelligent? AI. Yeah, AI, yeah, all that stuff. You've got to be prepared for the new era. You can't go back. This was just a taste of what it was like. What do you want to do moving forward as the body of Christ at Riverside Church? Thank you do, very much. Do we have one second to, so one thing you mentioned or alluded to earlier, um, what Riverside was to be. What was the vision? Do you have some insight um, to share? Everyone would say it differently, but as I recall reading Bostick's work and uh, living he was still alive when I was here. Church was so white. He got on the elevator with me one day. He said, nine, please. Um, the vision was to bring what we would call social and liberal theology into the mainstream of American society and not be caught up with um, conservative uh, come to Jesus moments where people didn't feel like they had to either be sinful or be tied into a church and not ever know who they were as individuals. So Fosdick was the, the leader of uh, Freud, if you were, of the, of the congregation to say, we can do all things, and read his sermons, read his prayers, they would like the prayers this morning, when he reaches out to whether it's in Vietnam, or the people who have uh, new virus is going around. He kept it all in the context of the daily life. He preached about when you go from here, you go out to your, your little apartment, one bedroom or a studio, and you know, God is there. And Billy Graham gave me this film, thinking you've all heard it when after 9-11 and you could hardly mount the pulpit. And after this, the crux of this sermon was what most clergy would say today. When you think about the days of the week and what you have to go through, God can be trusted. You think of those people falling down from a hundred floors. He was really saying that where God was with them. It didn't look like that to us. That's the only way I can accept it for what went on that day. God can be trusted. And I think moving forward, Debbie, is whatever it is, the fact that you know, that tower might fall someday, but maybe that's what has to happen. But God can be trusted. And we will come back from these uh, ruins, these dry bones. It will be a different kind of church, but it will still be Riverside Church. Thank you.
was the founding black church in New York. Mother Bethel in Philadelphia, but Abyssinia was the church here. And so he and, and, and uh, Martin King never got along. And basically it's because they were from two different sides of the track, theologically and socially, and Adam was, you know, good looking and sharp and had the women and so forth and so on. And King had the women, but he was dark and, uh, you know, would study hard and so forth and so on. And so they never quite philosophically, socially saw it. Adam wanted to do it through legislation. King wanted to do it, couldn't do it through legislation. He wasn't in any place, like Obama. So he had to start the movement. And so when it came to preaching here, two big churches, Abyssinia, the black community, Riverside here, you know, multi-racial. McCracken said, I want him to preach here. And therefore, the black churches that didn't, you know, they, they didn't want King to preach in their churches, they drove them out, but he preached here, and the people standing outside to get in. <coughs> so that was basically it. It was a kind of a philosophical, social thing that black people said, tend to have, but it went further than that in terms of how do you get things done? Legislatively, or by power, you know, and uh, power was the thing that uh, King did. With the, the movement stuff it never happened in the South without the marches and the uh, demonstrations and the freedom riders. When people were killed, uh, people began to look at them and say, "This, this has to stop." You know, ultimately, white people finally said that. Uh, it would never have gotten through legislation. Bilbo and Dolphos congressmen, you know, that were from the South, senators and congressmen, they went about to give it to the black people. They planned a way around it. And, and, and Powell thought he had a chance to do it that way, and King didn't feel the way. That's the only thing I can think of, those two things. Is that helpful? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions right quick? Yes. Uh, just and I, I don't hear too well, you have to speak loud. Yes. When they formed the Black Manifesto in Chicago and Julie Lucas Foundation, they said, we want to interrupt services. So they said, we have to go to Riverside first because Riverside, we could ask them for 500 million. Also, we thought it, there would be justice there. Um, so is that still our mission to be the justice church in America? Seems like we need a lot of organizing for the world to look at us again. And then quickly, that you organize youth and grant houses that's how you become a pastoral community church. You get the young people in and the parents follow. So what happened to that? Grand houses is still there. The police can arrest a hundred of them one day and we don't do anything. So how do we get what you did, the grand houses youth to come to Riverside and the parents follow so we become a community church? It's a different time. I don't know how it's done. Yeah, we're not doing it. Yeah. But I would like to see, is it still a vision that we become the Justice Church of America and do that organizing? Is that, do you see that still as a vision for Riverside? Thank you. Could you repeat what he said? So I don't think you know. Well, I, I just asked, is Riverside going to be the National Justice Church of America again? That's why the Black Manifesto came here. That's why King came here, because they viewed us as such. And then to be a community church, he went to grand houses and brought the youth here. Well, we're not doing that now, so we're not a community church. Shall we become that? <laughs> but many churches now are uh, organized, more so than they were in 1960, for social justice. And I think that if we, we say we are the body um, of Christ. If we are um, here as one body, then we need to take the time to discern together what it is that God is calling us to be. Not what this person wants to be and this person wants to be. We actually need to be intentional about um, and prayerful about what God is calling us to do. I'm going to, ven I'll venture to guess that our history is what is going to move us forward in a similar direction. I don't see us veering off, off but I can't really speak for you. Yes, uh, I think. Paul, do you have a, a documented your biography? Do you have a book? I mean, because what you said, I feel like it's just the icing on the cake, but I want the cake. <laughs> Oh, I have, I've written my memoir, yes. Yeah.
say quickly, thank you for those remarks, that um, I went through this probably 30 years ago with the committee about uh, the statue of King, and so the compromise was we would, we would name the South Wing, Martin Luther King. King so what's it called now? MLK. Now what does that mean to the young people? It just means MLK. They don't get the significance of Martin Luther King. And that, that can easily happen. So here we are. I can't see that.
Betra and her husband were very much a part of the Black Christian Caucus. And thank you for those words. I think you're absolutely right. I think you're that to you. Yeah. Oh, one second. So the part of the beauty of this time together, I think, is hearing a lot of that history. Um, so it isn't just race. I didn't hear just race. I heard class. And I don't think you can have one part of the conversation um, without the other. But I agree. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, Thank you very much and thank you for being in peace.